Hello, good evening. It was a commuter nightmare. Two packed rush hour trains just outside the world's busiest railway junction and a crushing impact. Many fatalities, much heroism, profound shock and scores of injuries, many of them appalling. And only one question, why? Tonight, British Rail begin to give an answer to that question and they say they accept full responsibility for the accident. First, at least 36 people are killed in one of Britain's worst railway disasters. About 120 others are injured, many of them seriously. The accident happened in South London just after 8 this morning during the height of the rush hour. The 6.30 train from Bournemouth went into the back of the 7.18 from Basingstoke near Clapham Junction. A third train, which was empty, collided with the wreckage. The government has announced a public inquiry into the crash. The Transport Secretary Paul Channon said if action was found to be needed immediately, it would be taken without delay. And within the past hour, British Rail said preliminary investigations showed the probable cause of the accident was what they call a technical fault relating to work on modernising the signalling system on the lines to Waterloo. Mrs Thatcher said she was grief-stricken and the Queen issued a message of condolence to the families of the victims. The police said tonight they had documentary evidence identifying 17 of the bodies, but they said naming the others would be extremely difficult. The emergency number for inquiries about the accident is 01 834 77 Double seven. Our Home Affairs correspondent Anne Perkins reports from the scene of the disaster. The force with which the Bournemouth train smashed into the back of the stationary Basingstoke train was so great it was impossible to tell which wrecked carriages belonged to which train. A third train, leaving London empty, apparently killed some who had survived the first crash. One coach was thrown up the embankment. The rear coaches of the Basingstoke train and the front of the Bournemouth train were crushed beyond recognition. It all happened so quickly, survivors said, they had no time to wonder what was happening nor to brace themselves for the impact. From our point of view, we were just simply on the train, most people were dozing and uh, there was a there was no sensation of a screech of brakes or anything else. It was just a very sudden stop, and obviously everybody piled forward, which is how I got this crack. And then uh, people stayed in the train. There was no panic or anything. People were just looking for handbags or whatever. A few of us got off the train and went up the bank, and all we could tell was the train seemed to be piled up on the embankment in front of us. I was in the first carriage, and uh, there was just a big bang, and uh, a couple things fell over. And I started walking back to have some medical training, and. Uh, a lot of people really badly hurt. Well, it felt like a bit of a jerk. I, I, I felt jerks like that on the normal uh, commuting train. But uh, it was very... Uh, obviously, he carried on and then we tipped sideways. It was a tipping of the sideways that threw everybody about rather than the uh, uh, actual impact. So when did it dawn on you that something quite serious was, uh, had happened? Well, it sort of got progressively worse. Obviously, when the train tipped sideways and the windows started to break, it was, uh, that was the case. And then it was a question of trying to get out. The fire brigade, there within minutes, found hundreds of passengers, some merely shocked, others badly cut, and dozens trapped in the wreckage. The less seriously injured were moved out onto the tracks, the carriage seats serving now as emergency beds. The rescue services could only reach the injured down a steep embankment. Makeshift handrails had to be rigged up across a section of fence. Stretcher cases, at first lashed to ladders, were gingerly carried over the roof of one train and then perilously, almost vertically up to the waiting ambulances. Uninjured passengers stayed to help the emergency services, an early problem simply finding who was trapped where. One carriage had simply had its roof peeled back as if by a gigantic tin opener. Firemen were using air and oxycetylene torches to cut passengers free. Soon doctors from all the local hospitals were also there. Some passengers had to have limbs amputated before they could be moved. The officer in charge said his men had found carnage. I think the main problem is that it's a very compressed working area. Um, 
it's similar to Moorgate where, where trains collide and you compress everything together. Uh, the bodies are compressed, as, are the, as is the wreckage. And we found that uh, having to get between and sometimes above dead bodies to release those who are still injured always causes problems because you're, you're trying not to abuse the bodies of people who are there, even though they may be dead. It's a very difficult situation. The priority was for the survivors, but with remorseless frequency, the bodies were brought out. A temporary mortuary was set up nearby. Local children, whose school overlooks the disaster site, were among the first to go and help, bringing tea and hot water to survivors and rescue workers. Three hours after the disaster, and the transport secretary was at the scene, praising the work of the emergency services. This is clearly a very major and tragic disaster, and I'd like to say how deeply sorry I am and to send my sympathy to the relatives of those who died and to those who have been injured. I think one lesson that one can say straight away is that there has been magnificent cooperation between the emergency services who have handled this tragic situation with extreme skill and speed and have cooperated with each other in an admirable way, and I'd like to thank them all. By one o'clock, all the survivors have been freed from the wreckage. The only remaining task as the heavy cranes and cutting machinery was brought in, the freeing of the last bodies. But it is an appalling tragedy. And uh, obviously that myself and the members of the board want to extend sympathy to all those families that have lost loved ones and also hope that those that are injured will recover quickly. The injured have been taken to three local hospitals at St George's in Tooting, it's a first test for a brand new accident and emergency department which hadn't even been open long enough for a rehearsal. We've only been in this actual new uh, department here for eight days. Obviously haven't had a chance to have a major disaster procedure which we would normally do, but uh, what happened today I think is a good enough practice and let's hope it doesn't happen again. As casualties continue to arrive, many urgently needing blood transfusions, the blood donor service had appealed urgently for volunteers. Doctors at the scene had coped with an appalling range of serious injuries. There were at least five people who had to be cut out. And three of those um, took some little time to cut out because they were quite seriously crushed. But um, the services coordinated themselves extremely well and each person who was trapped had with them uh, a team of medical officers and ambulance men, has been, as has been indicated, and most of them, that included a surgeon and an anaesthetist. And I have to say that the uh, basic emergency care service, which is run, as you know, by the uh, general practitioners, also did an excellent job. Tonight, the rescue effort is over, though the clearing up goes on. With the immediate emergency ended, the question people are now asking is what went wrong. Anne Perkins. Today's accident is the worst on British Rail since 1967, when an express train was derailed at Hither Green in South London, killing 49 people. So what did go wrong today? British Rail's statement tonight that a technical fault connected with signalling work on the line is the strongest indication yet of the cause. Nicholas Owen reports on what may have led to today's crash. Other Clapham Junction lines still busy emphasising that today's accident happened near Britain's busiest station. The safety systems which should protect commuters, though well tried and tested, still rely primarily on individual railwomen being on full alert. This morning, the Transport Secretary Paul Channon and, clad in an orange safety vest, British Rail's Chairman Sir Robert Reid, surveyed the crash scene from a fire brigade hydraulic platform. The man at the top knows there's going to be much critical interest in the findings of the official inquiries. Did Sir Robert have any early theories on why the crash happened? No, we're, we're making our inquiries now. It will take some time. Unfortunately, the driver of one of the trains was killed. Uh, he will, would have been a vital witness. And we, it will take us a bit longer because we have to put, analyse every bit of equipment now. It's clear one heavily loaded train heading for London was stopped at a red signal when it was rammed from behind by another, also crowded and apparently running late. Had that train passed a danger signal protecting the stationary one, travelling on round this bend into disaster? If so, why? Those are the central questions. The crash occurred on the southwestern line running through Clapham Junction, bringing in trains from a wide area of southwest London, Surrey and Hampshire. 
A train from Basingstoke running on the up main track was brought to a stand by a red signal just beyond Battersea Rise. A signal behind it just north of Trinity Road should have been at danger, protecting the Basingstoke service. But whatever it showed, the following Bournemouth train went past that signal, colliding heavily with the Basingstoke train and hurling wreckage into the path of a third empty train travelling south on the adjoining line. From the extent of the wreckage, it's likely the Bournemouth train was travelling at a fair speed. The maximum permitted here is 65 miles an hour. Now, the safety apparatus in current use works from the driver's point of view like this. If he sees a green signal, a bell sounds in the cab and he drives on. If he sees an adverse signal, two or one yellows or a red, a buzzer sounds. Unless he cancels that within a few seconds, the brakes go on automatically. So a driver can pass a green signal, no problem, then more cautionary aspects ending with a red. Each time he is buzzed, he should bring the speed down. A train travelling at 60 miles an hour takes about half a mile to pull up. Absent-minded cancellation has been a factor in some accidents in the past. Such driver error was blamed for the crash four years ago at Wembley in North London when three people died. The signalling on the southwestern lines through Clapham Junction is controlled by this relatively antique installation at the junction itself. But it's being modernised and a dramatic announcement by BR an hour ago said that a technical fault caused by going over to this sort of new signalling system elsewhere on the railway was the probable cause. So, a mistake by the driver of the Bournemouth train, which for much of the day looked like the most likely cause of the accident, now looks highly unlikely. Well, our information is that the signals were green and reverted to red, which is an emergency situation as far as the driver's concerned. The first train. The first train. But did the signals also turn red for the signals being used by the second train? Presumably, in a proper signalling system, that ought to happen. But you have no definite information on whether it did happen? No definite information, because the following train was badly damaged on impact. There may be criticism, too, of the crowded conditions commuters have to put up with and the construction of the 20-year-old coaches which came to grief today. But the most important issue may well be whether individual staff bear too much heavy responsibility in the congested rail conditions they now face. On the much maligned underground, every red signal has a stop device. Any train which tries to pass a red aspect, however caused, is brought automatically.